All right, hi everybody, John Meadows here. Welcome to 2020. Today um, is, a, is a great day to start the new year. And I wanna to talk today to the naturals out there. Uh, I have probably half my clientele is natural, half probably isn't. But uh, I wanna talk about how do you get in better shape as a natural? What are the keys to getting leaner? But first, before we do that, Alexander has a trick. All right, Alexander, for your yo-yo trick, what are you gonna do? The Matrix. Very good. Thank you. Wow. All right, so what are we talking about again? My mind is kind of blown from that. So how do we get naturals in shape better? All right, number one, let's start off with the basics. You got to track your calories. I see way too many people that just kind of eyeball stuff. Um, which isn't bad once you've done this for many, many years and you have a good idea. Um, but I think you need to be very precise. You know, if you're, particularly if you're natural, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. So if your little snacks here and there, little bites here and there, that extra 100, 200 turns into 300 calories, and now you're not in it, you're not even in a deficit. You might have thought you were in a deficit. So the first thing I want you to do is actually track your calories. Um, that means measuring your food, that means very precise. Now, it's not gonna be like this forever, but we need you to find out kind of what your maintenance level of calories is. What is the amount of calories that you eat that just maintains and keeps you normal? Once you know that, you can put yourself in a deficit, but people try to just, you know, they start what they think is reducing, but there's, there's really no plan. So, you know, some days they might eat a lot less than their maintenance level, some days they might not eat more, but you have to have a plan. That is the number one basic fundamental thing, especially as a natural, you don't have the wiggle room. So track your calories, figure out where you're at maintenance wise, and then we're gonna put in a deficit. Now for the deficit, I want you to do a 10% deficit. So if you're eating 2000 calories, for example, it'd be 200 calories for a deficit, 3,300. Um, maybe if you're a female, you're eating 1500 calories, start with a 10% deficit. That's probably not a perfect number for everybody, but it's a good place to start. So start with that deficit. That's gonna get you, once you find your maintenance level, start with that deficit. That's gonna get you going. That's number one. All right, number two is nutrient timing. Oh, nobody believes in nutrient timing. Well, I have a challenge that I've issued to people who don't believe in it. I still have yet to have anybody take me up on it. If you don't believe nutrient timing works, I want you to try something. I want you to put all your meals away from your workout. So if you work out, say at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, don't eat until six o'clock at night. Or maybe if you have two meals, if you're one of those people, you know, maybe do a four o'clock and a nine o'clock. But train, but, but keep your meals away from your workout. See how you feel, okay? Then I want you to put your, some of your calories around training, pre-workout, post-workout, and then note how you feel. I can 100% guarantee you, if you're training hard, if you're putting out a lot of effort, that you're gonna recover 10 times better with nutrients around your actual workout. Now, it blows my mind that people say nutrient timing doesn't matter, then they hashtag science. Actually, science tells you the complete opposite. Science tells you the mechanical tension when you're training actually increases GLUT4 translocation, which is these carrier proteins that go to your cell membrane and they um, basically allow glucose and amino acids to get into your muscle cell much more efficiently than when you're not training. I could go on and on and on about that, but I'm not trying to teach a lesson on that today. But suffice to say, nutrient timing does matter. So what I want you to do is your carbohydrate intake, I want you to have carbs and obviously proteins before you train and after you train. That's going to help repair your muscle, okay? Yes, protein synthesis is good for maybe 24 hours, but you have an amount of time where your muscles are extremely insulin sensitive. We can drive nutrients in there around training. Oh, and guess what? Carbohydrates are a good source of energy. Why would you not want a good source of energy? Sure, maybe it feels good to train without any food in you for a little while, but what about when you're training really hard? What about when you wanna do a cluster cell max squat? I would rather have some fuel in me to train. It's just common sense. Most of the people that I know, not everybody, I don't wanna generalize and say everybody, but most of the people that I know that don't like to eat at all anytime around training, they either get up in the morning and go straight to the gym, but they had a big dinner the night before, which I think is a great plan, or they just don't train hard because they just can't push yourself. 
So I want you to have meals around your training before and after. Now there's another reason for that. We need to protect your muscle as a natural. And it's very important, I think, to get aminos and get those things right back in your muscle when you're training to help facilitate uh, repair. You're actually slowing down muscle protein breakdown when you do that as well. If you look at some of the studies on when people actually train really hard, cortisol levels go up, they can detect muscle protein breakdown. Uh, there's various different ways to detect it. But when there are nutrients around training, that stuff is, is managed much, much better. So again, um, your, the, what, what you eat around training is gonna be a big deal. You wanna keep your muscle, okay? Muscle requires a lot of calories. If you start losing your muscle, then you're gonna to have to make that deficit worse and worse and worse and worse. You're gonna start losing strength. Your muscles are gonna get much, much smaller. And that's what, not what we want. So we need to be very precise about that as a natural. That's number two. All right, number three, uh, speaking of training, what about your training style? Uh, one, of the, um, <laughs> one of the things that everybody's talking about now is training volume. High volume, low volume, you know, is it this study says 10 to 20 sets a week, this study says this, this study says that. I don't know what happened to experimenting and figuring out what works best for you, but that's always my answer. It'd be silly for me to tell everyone watching this video, you need to do 12 total sets a week. That may be true for some people, but it's not true for everybody else. So I want you to experiment. There are some things I want you to think about with your training style though, okay? When you start getting into these really, really, really high volumes, it creates a lot of muscle protein breakdown, particularly when you're in a caloric deficit. Um, it becomes very hard to recover. So I start to become a little bit more proponent of a little bit lower volumes just because you can repair a little better. And when you're in a caloric deficit, that repair is, is um, it's, it's much more important. Uh, it's always important, but it's, it's, I think it's a little bit more emphasis should be on the recovery part. Um, now, whether you're training low volume or high volume, you have to train hard, all right? Another thing that is driving me absolutely bananas are all these people saying, you don't really have to train that hard. Leave two or three reps in a tank on every set. That will not get you to your ultimate potential. I promise you that. If you never push yourself, you know, there's an old saying, you never know where the line is until you cross a little bit. If you never push yourself, how in the world are you ever going to know you hit your potential? I just don't buy it. Now, how many sets need to be to failure and so forth? That becomes an interesting discussion. Generally speaking, on each exercise I do, I like to take one set to total failure, which means I cannot get one more rep with good form. And then maybe I'll do one or two uh, exercises beyond failure where there's a cluster set or a drop set or partials. So if I were to use, say, four exercises, that's going to be four sets to total failure. Um, and maybe two of those will be beyond failure. And those are very demanding. So, you know, you do a couple sets to lead up to that set. That's a good model, I think, to start with for a lot of people, particularly for naturals. If you start doing... I'm going to do four sets of failure on dumbbell ropes. Then I'm going to do four sets of failure on deadlifts. Then I'm going to do four sets of failure at chins. You're going to have a really, really hard time recovering from all that work. Um, if you want to go a little bit easier, if now there is another, there is another side to this. I, like, I try to look at every point of view. If you just can't get yourself to train that hard, then it is a good idea to add some more sets and add some more volume because you're leaving reps in a tank. Volume does matter. Um, it, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because it does matter. Um, and so that approach sometimes work for, works for people a little bit. It's a little different approach, and I have no issues with that approach either. There, there's times when I do that. There's times when I get to the gym, I just don't have it in me to, to just go all out uh, on every set that day, on the, the last sets. I just don't. But I make up for it. I do some more sets, and I get a little bit more volume. Um, and actually it's usually harder to recover from that, which going back to my other point, these high, high volumes are what's hard to recover from. So your training as a natural has to be on point. You got to be a little bit more lower volume. Um, I hesitate to say, and I hesitate saying everybody, but I think most of you need to be a little bit lower volume because the higher volumes are going to require so much more repair and you don't have all the anabolics. You do not have all the gear that the other guys have that's helping them repair. You don't have that. You have your nutrition and guess what? You're in, a, you're in a deficit. So it's even harder. So let's be smart about our training. That's number three. Number four is something called NEAT. Those of you who study total energy expenditure have heard that term. 
uh, need is uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's what you're doing when you're not exercising. So just walking around the house and things like that. Now, if you look at total energy expenditure, you see your metabolism, just what it take, takes to keep the lights on. Um, that's a big number. And then you have some small numbers, you know, the thermic effect of food, you know, protein is a little bit more thermic than carbohydrates or fat. You can burn a little bit more calories. It, it's a small number. The actual, the actual exercise itself, energy expenditure, is not a huge number. The need is actually higher than both of those numbers. So what I mean is it should be people talk about doing their cardio and their training, and they should. That's important. But you could almost make the case that's even more important to focus on your need because that's where a lot of your total energy expenditure comes from. It could be 15%, 20%. It's a very significant number. So as you're dieting, if you stop being active, that caloric deficit you went in may not be a deficit, right? Because you're not moving around. Now you're not burning as many calories. So you got to make sure whatever you're doing um, during the day, you keep doing that at a minimum while you're in a deficit and you're trying to lose body fat. A lot of people, they get real tired. They start taking naps all the time. And trust me, I love a good nap. But when you turn into a couch potato, that need goes way down. And now you got to go into more of a deficit. So people think, well, now I got to do more cardio. I got to do cut my calories even more when really it might have helped them just to stay more active. Um, park away from the gym just so you have a longer walk to get there. Go outside, walk around the block for 10 minutes in the morning and just at a calm, calm pace and just kind of get your mindset for the day. Just little things like that throughout the day. But neat, very important, and that's number four. Number five is rest. Everybody's talking about sleeping now. I've been talking about it probably the last two years in my seminars and how important it is for recovery. I think everybody's kind of got the message now. Yeah, we get it. It's important to get your eight hours of sleep. There's um, a lot of reasons why it's important when you're dieting too. So if you do some research, you'll see that sleep deprivation studies that are done with four hours, I think some of them are six hours, you'll see an increase in a hormone called ghrelin that your stomach makes, which makes you hungry. You'll see a decrease in leptin. It's a hormone that your fat cells make. It's a, it's a satiety hormone. It tells you, okay, I'm full, I don't need any more. Those go completely backwards when you're sleep deprived. Um, and, the, and the worst thing is, is that that hunger that you get from ghrelin, it's a hunger. You, people usually want to eat more sugar. They want more carbs. So they're hungry. They're more hungry for junk food. They're being less satiated by the food they're eating. It's really a bad combination. Cortisol levels are higher. Um, you know, that can cause insulin resistance just because your pancreas is pumping out insulin all the time, trying to control the blood sugar being high. So you got to make sure you get your sleep. Um, of course, for your hormones, the non-REM stage in sleep is when you have growth hormone secretion and all that stuff. But I think just make sure you get your eight hours of sleep. And you've probably seen all the tips. No electronics two hours before you go to bed. Make sure you're sleeping in 60 to 69 degree temperature, preferably around maybe 65 to 67. Um, blackout curtains, um, something that relaxes before you go to bed. All those things that everybody's talking about now, those are all very important. So make sure you focus on that sleep so you get good recovery. And again, remember, you're training hard, you're in a caloric deficit, so recovery is paramount, and sleep is a big part of that recovery equation, particularly if you want to keep your muscle too. So that's my five tips um, for naturals. I hope that helps you all. Certainly feel free to ask questions in the comments, and I'll get to them as best I can. As you guys know, I read everything that comes through. Thank you for all your support. Let's have an awesome year in 2020, and we'll see you next time.